Ever wonder how many right decisions James Bond needs to make to accomplish his mission? Well, today we're going to decode how many times he has to be right just in the end game of Dr. No. Hi, this is Dan. And Tom. Of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. Remember to hit the like and subscribe buttons below and click the bell to be notified whenever our Cracking the Code of Spy Movies channel puts out a new video. Okay, we're going to examine the decision tree that Bond makes in the final moments of the movie, Dr. No, and see how realistic his plan was to stop Dr. No from disrupting more American missile launches. Now pay attention, 007. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Dan, when you told me you wanted to do this, I was like, how many decisions does he have to make? But as we go (laughs) through this, it's it's like he's got to make a bunch of decisions and they've all got to be right. They got to be right. (laughs) All right, let's jump in. James Bond is in his cell, coming to, you remember, after getting softened up by Dr. No's henchman. He immediately starts to look around the cell, looking for a means to escape. All right, he sees a vent above the bed, and he figures immediately that that might be his ticket out. Yeah, now, of course, he didn't even try to examine the door or to see if there was a way for the door to open. But, (laughs) you know, no. It's the vent. It's got to be the vent. (laughs) It's got to be the vent. (laughs) All right. Admittedly, we see no handle or hinges on the door. So, okay, maybe he's got a reason not to look. But, you know, I would have checked it anyway. I think you're right. So, (laughs) well, maybe it would have been fruitless. Who knows? But I'd at least give it a try. (laughs) Push it. Maybe it didn't open. All right. So, Bond steps upon the bed. And he pushes on the grate. We hear a nice sizzling noise as it's obviously electrified. (laughs) Yeah, now the cool thing about this is we saw the shot of Bond's face from the other side of the grate. Yeah, I liked it. So as he touches it, it then switches immediately to the cell side. So it's nice that they give us both perspectives on that. Yes. And it's it's really good camera work. And it's an, one, another one of those things that's probably easy to miss that you might not even register that that happened. But right. it really is a nice piece of cinematography that it had, I think it added to the tension and the surprise we felt when we heard that flash and the sizzle. Yeah, I, I think it, it actually brought us into it in, in terms of feeling the sizzle with Bond so that we're surprised with him from that shot. Now, you could see his face going, okay, I got through that somehow. Yeah. So, Whew. you know, <laughs> it, it, after he gets in there, it's like, oh, you know, but immediately you're, you're like feeling it with him. It's like, boom. Yeah. Ah, okay. All right. So, hey, the good thing is Bond's not dead. <laughs> wow. That, that I didn't know they allowed that in Bond movies anymore. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but he's got to figure out this grate. I mean, it's electrified. In seconds, he figures he will use his shoe to bang the grate. So he does, and within a few bangs, the grate is loose and only hanging from one side. Success! (laughs) It's amazing how that worked. (laughs) This is another one where we see the happening from the other side of the grate as well as the cell side. So it's it's really nice to see they, they keep that going here while he's trapped in the cell. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, again, if I were Bond, I'd want to make sure that the, the electrifying element is disabled. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one side is still kind of connected. How's he going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, bang it again with your shoe. But Bond climbs up and into this tunnel. And we see this from the inside of the grate again. And like you said, he does touch the grate with his clothed upper body, but no sizzle this time. So, hey, that's well, good. It was in his hand. <laughs> Although, actually, <laughs> yeah. actually, I think the sizzle was, no, that was his hand touching it. So that, yeah, 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 that was his hand. Yeah. Yeah. But he's in some type of tube, and after crawling a few yards, his choice of turning left down another connected tube or going straight down a long tube, that decision has to be made. Now what? You can see when he's, when he's sitting there trying to make that point, that decision, you know, we talk about the fact that there's all these decision points. Just look at the uncertainty on his face. I mean, yes, he blinks, yes. he closes his eyes for a second while he's like thinking through yes. which way to go. And again, he knows he has to make a decision. It better be right. And so, again, a really nice touch for this scene as it aligns his fears with ours. Yeah, I think it's very clever of that. And it does exactly that. It does bring us into the scene and into the 
fear of what might happen next, or hey, you got to make the right choice here. Yeah, so, really. Which, which way is he going? Forward it is. Avanti <laughs> in Italian, as we say. Forward. <laughs> All right. We hear sounds, but we do not know if he is hearing them or it's just us hearing them. But another decision point is coming up. Another tube leans down, and he's looking down it, and we are as well. Now, he could climb down it because there's those ridges and there's people yeah. where the pieces are joined together. So he could use that for footing. Will he go straight or go down? Yeah. Now think hey. about this. He's on one level still. The level from where he climbed a few feet into the tunnel from the cell. Yeah. And he, he knows on this level there are at least some rooms, something, yeah. so he has to he decide <laughs> whether he's going to continue straight on the same level or if he's going to head down. Yeah, it's another decision point. Which way are you going to go? Down or straight? Hey, man. So Choices, again, choices, choices. <laughs> he has to decide right. <laughs> he must make the right decision because he has no idea where any of these tunnels are leading him, really. He has no yeah, clue. really. <laughs> he's again. just in tunnels. Again, yeah, wait, though, wait, maybe he's going to pull out his schematic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Again, you can see the uncertainty in his face, again, which adds to the drama and good piece of acting here by Sean Connery, which is it really is great acting. And it's nice when you see that kind of tension in his face and it's sharing the tension with us. So that that part is good. Well, where is he going? He decides to go down. I don't, again, this is risky. He doesn't know what the hell's down there. What's he going down into? He has no idea, really. It might be deep underground or lead to the ocean. What does he know? So that chance of this being the right decision is got to be iffy. He is clueless, really. Well, maybe he's like Jason Bourne and he was able to rip off a map of where he was going from the wall. <laughs> yeah, right. I didn't see him ripping any map. We get a shot of him from below looking up at him and it looks like maybe he's climbed 20 feet or so down this tube and then we heard that sound and it it sounds almost like a ricochet sound in the tube and bond immediately falls we have no idea what that sound was now was no. it a coincidence is that what made him fall maybe i mean fortunately he only falls a few feet maybe five or six feet so it seems like he's okay yeah now, I love the camera angle from below up at Bond in this particular scene because a lot of times when a camera angle is looking up at the subject, it is respecting the subject and saying something good about the subject because you're not looking down on the subject. So here, it might be telling us, maybe, that Bond made the right decision again going down the tube. Let's, let's hope he did because... He better have made that decision, right? Getting out of the gate, that was fairly easy. And then left or straight in the tunnel, and he went straight. Then he had straight or down, and he went down. Yeah. So as, as he's doing this, you talk about these decisions. I mean, he's got to be purely guessing as to what to do. And what are the yeah. real chances of him guessing right? I mean, we have to remember that Dr. No is about to interfere with the launch of the American missiles. That's what we know or will know. But Bond has no idea of this timeline. He's he knocked out trying. when he's in the cell, and he has no idea for how long he was knocked out. Right. But he, no. but he knows he needs to escape, and that we understand. <laughs> yeah, that part we understand. <laughs> that part Whether we he's going to be in time to do anything is another question, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so he's fallen out of this tube down five or six feet. Crawling some more, he now realizes the tube is hot. And he can no longer just touch the metal barehanded. So MacGyver-like, he takes his jacket off and tears it up to make pads for his hands. <laughs> the cool thing here is they, they communicate to us, it is hot, by Bond pulling back his hands, bringing them up to his mouth to blow on. And that was a nice moment. No words, no screams, no anything. But they communicated to us, Ooh, the tube is hot. That was cool. Yeah, that was. And... The fact that he blew on him told you that it wasn't ice cold, right? Because you might have had the same reaction of your hands pulling off if it was really, really cold. But if it was yeah. really, really cold, you wouldn't be blowing on your hands. So I think that the motion of his hands coming back say something's wrong here, and the blowing on the hands let us know that it's hot. Yeah. So he goes forward, 
and this liquid comes rushing down a tube at him. Now, we don't know what this liquid is, but after a couple of waves of it, Bond still seems okay. I mean, we have no idea if it was hot, steamy water, if it was cold water, or what kind of liquid Bond it was. Bond just seems fine. Whew. Boy, yeah, thank gosh. Whew. But a few seconds later, we see steam all over the tunnel, and Bond is in the middle of it all. But he still seems okay. He crawls down another tunnel. Now, keep in mind, if that were you or me, we would be clueless as to where we were or what might happen next. We'd be lost in a forest of tubes. But Bond, he's making his way to another grate with light on the other side. Why the water didn't go that way, we don't know. But it appears as though, against all odds, Bond has made every decision right so far. Yeah, I think that that's not likely that that would have happened, huh? <laughs> we'll see how unlikely it is, really. Because like, like you said, we'd be clueless, so we'd probably yeah. make the wrong choice. But this is yeah. Bond. This is Bond. <laughs> now, of course, he remembers the electrification of the great from the cell. So he kicks this grate with his shoes, and I think he uses three kicks to do it. Yeah, it must have not be fast and all that well. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the grate is just hanging there by the upper right corner as we see it from the outside. Wow, he's good. <laughs> you mentioned he kicked with his shoes, Tom. Yeah, well, we never saw <laughs> or knew that he put his shoes back on. <laughs> all right? I mean, he was banging at the grate and again, and then he climbed into the tunnel. Uh, except when he was crawling into the tunnel initially after knocking the grate with his one shoe. You can see his feet as the camera shot is from the inside of the tunnel out. We see he has his shoes on. There's a little mystery. Now, there. I'll just call that an edit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, smashing the grate off with his feet is another decision he makes. And it makes a lot of noise. Yeah, it's not very but, clandestine to be going bang, bang, bang. Yeah, no. Perhaps he just had to do it, no matter what. But it could draw attention to him because it makes a lot of noise. Yeah, but all he's right. making all the right decisions, so nobody heard it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. All right, so it's only a short hop down, lucky for Bond, and he finds himself in the decontamination room that he and Honey were brought into before, right after they were captured. Well, apparently so far, he has made all the right decisions. The probability of that is low, <laughs> though. <laughs> well, now we don't know for sure these are the right decisions, Dan, because in this decontamination chamber, there could be guards outside it, and he's going to get nailed when he gets out. So we don't there know that the decisions are correct. But he got out of the tunnels, and all of those were the right decisions, and now he's out. So that, he's escaped. So, so far, he's been successful, and he got himself out. But he sees this guy, though, entering the decontamination area, walking past the dangling grate that Bond just kicked out. Of course, he didn't notice that, but, you know, hey, he's got a hazmat suit on, so maybe no peripheral vision. <laughs> it's probably <laughs> minimal <laughs> to bad best, right? So this is believable that he would maybe not see the great dangling there. Now, this guy is probably a good six inches shorter than Bond. And Bond strangles him from behind and takes his hazmat suit. Yeah, now the, the, the size difference is pretty funny. Because it's yeah. like, don't worry, Eon Productions, no one's going to notice. <laughs> yeah. That's six yeah. foot two bond and then this shorter guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. With me being a guy who's not six two, yeah, I'm rooting toward her guy. <laughs> yeah, right. But somehow uh, Bond's going to be okay with that little hazmat suit. All right. It's another decision point, though. Right? Yeah. Maybe Bond just wanted the hazmat suit to disguise himself. Okay, that makes sense. But the next scene, what's he doing? He's walking into the control room where Dr. No and his workers are preparing to interfere with another American missile launch. I mean, if you look at this Ken Adam set, I mean, this thing is absolutely <laughs> spectacular. Of course. I mean, it's Ken Adam. He always does yeah. these things well. <laughs> right. I mean, now the cool thing is, the budget for this film was only a million dollars. He got a million dollars to do the volcano, and you only live twice. Here, yeah. the whole movie was done with a million dollars, yet he was able to give us this control room. Yeah. And so this control room, I mean, it looks official and very believable. 
and yeah, we cool. get and we get a really revealing wide shot of the room so we can take it all in. Bafan, who somehow got into that smaller hazmat suit, <laughs> is now in the control room. <laughs> Big man, what? little jacket. <laughs> what timing, right? I mean, what timing? He had no idea what time it was, no idea how long he was knocked out, no idea how long he was in the cell. But he's walking in right when they're about to interfere with American missile launches. Wow! That, that is really good. Really, yeah. You know, very good timing on Bond's part. <laughs> yeah. Another chance decision that seems to be the right one. Man, he's lucky, or he's just good. <laughs> <laughs> or both. Or both. Because I actually think if we do an analysis of all of the movies, luck is about as much part of his success as skill. Yes. And so often somebody else does something that that helps him or saves him. Yeah, absolutely. All right. (laughs) So now the Dr. No crew is viewing the U.S. launch preparation, and they're preparing their nuclear reactor instruments and equipment to interfere. Bond seemingly towering over the others (laughs) is going to walk over, and he's walking, and he picks up a file folder to look official, I guess. Now take a look, and you'll notice that there are no name tags on the hazmat suits. That's lucky. Yeah. But Dr. Noah's calling out orders and then checking in with each of the sections to make sure, like for a launch, that all systems are go. What about those name tags is Dr. Noah's going to call out a name. How does Bond know to react to that name? Because there's no name tag on the hazmat yeah. suit. <laughs> but That's a good point. Oh, well, <laughs> that's the way it happens. <laughs> Yeah. It, Bond notices one worker turning the wheel with a sign overhead that says reactor on. And the wheel he is turning has a limit because in the middle of the meter is danger zone. And we see the reactor in the cooling pool rising on metal frames. Okay, so does Bond have any idea of what's going on here? I mean, maybe a little? But his eyes are fixed on the man who's turning the wheel and keeping it below the danger zone. Does Bond have any clue about that? No. (laughs) But he's thinking, I got to do something to get it into the danger zone, though, right? (laughs) I I guess. Is the danger zone good or bad? I don't know. I mean, we've seen this wheel. We've seen this wheel enough to know that somehow Bond must get to the wheel and turn it beyond the danger zone. That's what Bond's thinking. I got to turn this thing beyond the danger zone, of course, endangering his own life, which is pretty... Pretty spectacular of him, and that of everyone else, of course. But he's Bond for Queen, now King, and Country. Now, Dr. Gno calls out each component to make sure it's ready. Control, thermal converters, radiation, energy stabilizers, and each signals it's ready. Then he calls out fuel elements. No answer. Fuel elements. Fuel elements. Another worker points to Bond. Six foot two Bond, much taller, we are sure, than Chang, but no worries. And again, no names on the suits, like you said, Tom. And how did they know that was Chang? What are you doing there? (laughs) And he tells him to get onto the gantry. Well, that's nice and convenient. Well, no one suspects that Chang, though he is much taller than usual, is not in the right place. Well, now, to be fair... He's standing there by himself, so you don't have another yeah. person there for reference. <laughs> no, that's true, but he looks big. Yeah. <laughs> so Bond climbs up the gantry where the wheel is, and Dr. No orders, shut down the reactor, and the man starts to turn the wheel left. Meantime, the Americans are talking at Mercury Control, and Mercury was indeed the first manned space program name for the United States. So that, that was all accurate. Yeah, I like, how, no- I like how they did that. Yeah, that was cool. Dr. No gets the radio beam synchronized. Remember, this is how they disrupt the American missiles. American's first man in space, actually, was Alan Shepard. He was launched in a Mercury capsule May 5th, 1961. But there were several test launches of the missile and unmanned capsules before that. So Dr. No actually reflects some good history here. Yeah, it's, it's like, like it. he's, tr- he's trying to manipulate what's going on with what the space agency is really trying to do. So the timing of this thing, given that it's concurrent with when these tests are happening in the U.S., yeah, it's great Excellent. timing for the release of this movie. Yeah. So Bond not only has to choose wisely to kill that guy and take his hazmat suit, which 
somehow fit him. Then he enters the control room just at the time they're preparing to disrupt another American space launch. Amazing. But he also got Chang's spot, which is up on the reactor platform, where the wheel is. Oh, now, my God. That's now, that is planning, or one hell of a lot of luck. And it seems like the latter. I'm going with luck. <laughs> then there's a shot of a radio beam antenna and water. And a small boat, which is obviously a scale model, but let's right. move yes. on. It's their first. Yes. It's their first Bond movie. We'll, we'll they give, actually we'll ran give. out and got a little toy boat because the director <laughs> wanted it in there. <laughs> he said, well, we need a boat. <laughs> it was. It was. It was good timing of them to do that. Yeah. So Bond is at the wheel and he begins turning it to the right, and he's going to get that meter just past the danger zone reading. And he gets it above there, and the original guy saw what was happening. Bond knocks him over the railing. Dr. No now sees it and yells to shut down. And a abandoned area light comes on and warning horns blare. Oh, no! <laughs> Bond's <Yeah>. caught! <laughs> Bond, one man, one man is causing absolute turmoil. And Dr. No will have none of it. He races towards Bond. He wants him to pay for this. <laughs> <laughs> You're oh, blowing man. my grand scheme. <laughs> <laughs> this continues on. There's a fight on the platform while we hear the Mercury rocket is launching undisturbed. Yeah. Now, if Dr. No could just land a hit with those metal hands of his, it could be the end of Bond. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Well, no tries several times to get the Bond, and he only partially connects or he misses. Yeah. Now, mostly misses. Yeah, mostly misses, which is, a, which is probably a good thing. Now, that platform that was in the cooling agent has started rising since the wheel's been turned to the right, and it's yep. past the danger zone. So it's trying to come up for us. And they both fall into the metal platform that rose out of this liquid. But for some reason, maybe their weight, the platform they're on begins to sink into the coolant. And fortunately, Bond gets the better of Dr. No and his metal hands, though strong, they can't grip the square posts and he sinks into oblivion. Yeah. Now, of course, Bond is going to get out of this room. He starts looking for honey. Which I thought was nice. Now, he could have just left, but he's going to risk his life to save hers. Yeah. And this That's shows pretty damn him, good. It is pretty damn good. And this shows us for the first time that Bond is not just in it for himself. Yeah. He's successfully completed his mission of shutting down Dr. No's operation. Right, so yeah. he's done with it. So really, get out of there. Done. You're done. Get out. To hell with right. everybody else. Get out yourself. <laughs> I mean, this is another big decision point, right? As a secret agent, a blunt instrument of the government, not a. This isn't a good decision. He should be leaving. <laughs> well, it could be a good decision for her. <laughs> yeah, definitely for her. This scene. I mean, Doctor No here has had a big influence on. Things to come in other spy movies and spy the whole spy genre, especially in the Bond movies. But in developing the Bond movie persona here, this incident where he's going to save Honey Rider is a big one. This we will see over and over again in Bond movies. We also get a callback to remind us what the mission was because we see the American missile take off successfully. So we heard about it a second earlier and then we see it. I mean, yep. whew, thank goodness. Yeah, I mean, all because of Bond, one guy. Of course, <laughs> there's chaos, and there's people running all over the place here to try to get the hell out of there. Well, they may know what a nuclear lives. reactor meltdown might do to them. <laughs> yeah, but Bond, no, he's, he's looking for honey. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's cool. You are a noble man, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and then he goes to her room like she would be sitting around there during all this commotion and turmoil. That was a funny moment, I thought. Come on, Bond, really? <laughs> Maybe, although she was locked up there, who knows? So he had a good look. <laughs> yeah, really. So, yeah. and then she's not there, so no. he goes out and in the hallway, and he randomly trips a guy, and he yeah. asks, where is she? You know, he wants to know where she is. And yeah. this guy was random here. He has no clue, and so Bond punches him. <laughs> since It's like, oh, you couldn't give me the information I want. Whack. Yeah. Bam. <laughs> But fortunately for him and for Honey, he runs into a woman and he asks her, where's the girl I brought with me? And she says, number 12. Bob yeah, seems he's not happy with that. Yeah, he seems disturbed <laughs> there, but he says, show me. And yeah. she does. And wow, 
honey is there. She's there all right, but she's chained down on this ramp and water is starting to flow in to drown her. I guess they wanted her to die a slow death. You know, a lot of times in Bond movies to come, it's a slow death. It's got to be a complicated way of dying and killing people. Hello, just kill her. When Bond bursts in the room, he quickly dismisses a guard and starts to run down the steps. And there's a moment where a shadow is cast against the wall. Yeah, I thought it was a cool shot. It's like he's running down another flight of stairs, another flight of stairs in the opposite direction. Just a lighting decision, maybe? Or does it show that Bond is bigger than Bond? Determined and now maybe at least somewhat in control. I liked this shot a lot. I thought it was great. Yeah, I, I actually did, too. And it reminded me of In the Adventures of Tartu. When Tartu is in that gas plant and he plays with the alarm, you see, you see a huge shadow of him. And actually, there are quite a few shadows of him when he's in this plant. Yeah, right? yeah. It's a great movie, by the way. Yeah, it is. If you haven't seen it, it's a really good spy movie, The Adventures of Tartu. Take a listen to our podcast episode on that one. Good yep. one. Absolutely, right. yep. Now, I also had to think of Peter Pan and his shadow. <laughs> All right. Because you've, got, All right. You, you've got this picture of Bond and his shadows against the wall, and it almost makes it look like he's running the separate direction. So when you get into Peter Pan, his shadow is doing something different. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so, like again, it's, it's Peter Pan predated this movie. Yeah, so what, did, 1953 or something that one. Yeah, 1953. So yeah. did it influence that one? Uh, and maybe uh, Dr. Facilier from Princess and the Frog, that was like 2009, when he wages his soul, his shadow disconnects from him. Maybe Dr. No influenced that movie. Yeah, either that one or it's either Peter Pan or Dr. No probably influenced Dr. Facilier. So that, that's, that was a good call. I, I, I forgot about that one out in the future. Yeah, yeah, one or the other. I don't know, or both. All right. Anyway, Bond is able to free her. Now, this scene was originally supposed to be filmed with her chained down, but instead of water, live black crabs were going to eat her to death, like in the novel. That would have been torture. Not for the crabs, for honey, I mean. <laughs> Dan, you're so bad. <laughs> but, but, when trying to, but when trying to film it, the crabs had been brought in chilled or frozen, and the whole scene just did not work, so they scrapped it. So this scene is far less dramatic and nerve-wrenching than the novel's version, I think. Well, and they've had issues, so they had the issues with the crabs here, and then in From Russia With Love, they had an issue with those rats that they were yeah. trying to, to film. Yeah, and you yeah, really yeah. didn't see a bunch of small animals in Bond movies after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're hard to control. Yes. <laughs> you can't train these little guys. <laughs> yeah. All right, let, let's cut to the outside now. And people are diving into the water, escaping by boat and running to get away. I mean, this place is going to explode. It's pandemonium. It's pandemonium. <laughs> it's broken loose. And now Bond and Honey must get out. All right, among the chaos and people running all over the place and diving into the water, Bond makes another correct decision to turn left <laughs> and get down to a boat. Ah, oh, that's good. So they jump down, commandeer a small boat, knocking two guys off of it, and get away just in time. Now, you say just in time. I mean, this is just in time. We have a nuclear reactor that's going to have a problem. And I'm not exactly sure they really get away just in time. Because it was really a nuclear reactor blowing up. They probably would have other issues. In any case, they get out of there just in time as Dr. No's lair explodes in glorious yeah. color. <laughs> yes. Now, yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. And, and you've got to give props to the miniature model makers here. Because this was very well done explosion in 1962. It was. I mean, yeah. there, there are two or three main explosions with flames and a lot of black smoke and pieces of debris flying all over. But Bond and Honey managed to get away uh, in a very peaceful is. scene. Yeah. I mean, more decisions Bond had to make during all of this. Find Honey rather than just get out himself. Then wing an escape plan. As he did. <laughs> as he had done. That's what he did. He set the whole thing exploding in motion himself, and then he thought, oh, how do I get out of here? 
<laughs> now it's well, time to leave. <laughs> mm, uh, yeah. If he were like Daniel Craig, he might have convinced Broccoli and Saltzman to just let him die there. A sacrifice of sorts. But nah, nah, that's just too corny. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's, I'm that's never going to let that go. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> I understand. Then through a veil of smoke, we see the boat floating, but we don't see Bond or Honey. Yeah. This is the moment. first James Bond movie. We don't know if there was going to be more. Might they have died? The scene, though, is pretty short. Plants that scene. But then we see Bond checking the engine. They've run out of fuel. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that old trope. <laughs> I mean, now this uh, does happen to Bond later in *License to Kill* when he's yeah, with Pam yeah. Bouvier. Timothy Dalton's Bond. Yeah, so that a fuel. This was kind of a good plan to try to escape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they got a little ways away. I don't know how much that's good for a nuclear reactor, like you said, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> now they're going to get away. The boat's not going anywhere, so they're away. They're in the water. Mm. I mean, they could swim. Come here. But Bond says, come here. Ah. So this is the first instance of Bond not wanting to be rescued right away when yeah. he has the Bond girl with him at the end. And out of nowhere, and you can't see who's in the boat since Bond and Honey are at the bottom. Goodbye, Mr. Bond. We, uh, this Navy boat approaches, and Lighter says, Ahoy, Mr. Bond. Okay, we have no idea that they knew where Bond was. I mean, was there a tracking device? I mean, yeah. who knows? I mean, we didn't see a tracking device for Bond. No, no, no. You know, they show us the tracking device in Goldfinger for Bond, yeah. but we don't see that here. Yeah, I yeah, know. It's, uh, it's how good Felix Leiter is. <laughs> but I also like the fact that Honey looks a little miffed and looks, you know, stomps her foot as she, lo- as she looks back at Leiter. So yeah. Bond throws them the rope so they can get towed. But why didn't they just get aboard the main Navy vessel? Why they get yeah. towed? I mean, and just leave this small, incapacitated boat? <laughs> Float away. Yeah, well, I mean, why would they do that? Well, <laughs> if we did that, we would miss the ending where Bond releases the rope that they're towed by. Ah, Bond, for the first time, tells us more of his character. <laughs> yeah, and a good one. A part of his character we will see many times to come. <laughs> yeah, I love it. So Bond and Honey, they sit back, and Honey starts to slide down towards Bond's midsection. <laughs> <laughs> but then we see them kissing. They couldn't show us too much more in 1962. <laughs> oh, that's true. We've talked about now, the Hayes Code many episodes. Now, this always bothered me here. In all reality, Bond would have gotten rope burns, I think, on his hands at the speed at which he released that. Movie rope. magic, Dan. <laughs> but he was okay. Thank goodness. All right. They roll the credits, and we have the first Bond movie in the can. Yes. Now, the chances of Bond making all of the right choices in a row that he did make in a row indeed is. Remote. Well, yeah, that's got a, that's some complex not math. A high percentage. No, it's not some, a high percentage. Some definitely some complex math there. All right, and here you go. If you flip a coin ten times, you get zero heads about point one percent of the time. So what is that? One standing head, on its edge. Yeah, <laughs> one head about one percent of the time. Two heads about four percent of the time. Three heads about twelve percent of the time. Four heads about twenty one percent of the time. And five heads about 25% of the time. Thus, the chances of getting five heads is about one in four. And that is about the percent that Bond had to make to make all the right decisions that he made in this ending of Dr. No. But he's Bond. Yeah, see, and I'm, I'm going to call you on those numbers for a second. Because <laughs> it was he had to make each of these right decisions. But you don't know if he hadn't gone down and if he had gone to the left would he eventually be able to get out? So the math is a little iffy here. I also think the odds are even worse in his favor than one in four. But still, <laughs> you know, if you if you look at that, it's it's convoluted math because there's a lot of other things you have to take into consideration because after choice one, then his choice two becomes something different. Does he end up in the same place? Yeah, we don't know that. We'll never know that, but... 
He's Bond, and this great decision-making, spectacular end of his mission is for us the first of many to come. They show us a lot in Dr. No and truly develop quickly the Bond movie persona, which is different than the novels, for sure, and a persona the world would come to know and love for decades. And here we are in Dr. No, the end. Hats off and other stuff. (laughs) <laughs> to bond. <laughs> uh, so that is a wrap of Dr. No and how Bond made every right decision to accomplish his mission. This is Dan and Tom of SpyMovieNavigator.com and our show Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. If you like this video, please click like and press the subscribe button right down here. And if you like this video, you can see another one similar to it by pointing right down here. And you can reach us on social media right here. Thanks for watching. We appreciate it.